Hi everyone. Today we're going to talk about the ideal gas law. So this law is going to combine everything we've learned about pressure, volume, temperature, and amount of a gas. Um, and we're going to kind of take all of those relationships and shove them into one equation. So one reason this might be useful is, let's say you're going camping and you have a butane uh, tank for a portable stove. Um, you could take the pressure, the volume, and the temperature of the gas in that tank and then plug it into the ideal gas law equation and figure out how much gas you have. So maybe you're trying to plan ahead, you know, how, how much butane should I bring with me on my trip? Um, so you could even incorporate like how much heat you need to cook your food, how much time that'll take. Uh, it could get complicated really quickly, but that's one way you could use the ideal gas law. Okay, so again, the gas law is a combination of all of those different variables we've talked about and their relationships. So what this comes down to is the ideal gas law equation. PV equals NRT. Now, some people like to say pivnert to remember this equation. Um, I usually just say PV equals NRT because then I kind of define all of the different variables there. All right, so we have pressure times volume is equal to uh, the amount of gas, N, times this new variable, R, which is called the gas constant. And then all of that is multiplied by temperature. So we could obviously rearrange this equation to solve for an unknown variable. Um, and talking about the gas constant more specifically, R is equal to 0 0.0821. And then there are a bunch of units associated with R. So we have liters times atmospheres over moles times Kelvin. Now you'll notice that we have units corresponding to each of the other variables in the equation. So liters corresponds to volume, atmospheres corresponds to pressure, moles corresponds to amount, and uh, Kelvin corresponds to temperature. So we need all of those different units in order to make sure this equality is true. Now, you could use other units in your gas constant, but that's going to change the value of the gas constant. So actually, if you look up gas constant on Wikipedia, there are a bunch of different gas constants listed there with different units. So, you know, you could use other values of R. It, it really just depends on the units that you have. Um, for our purposes, we're mostly going to stick to this value of R, 0.0821. So how do we know that R is equal to 0.0821? Well, if we rearrange the ideal gas law equation, we'll see that R is equal to pressure times volume over moles times temperature. And remember, earlier we learned about STP, so standard temperature and pressure, which was 273 Kelvin and one atmosphere. And we learned that at that specific temperature and pressure, one mole of a gas is equal to 22.4 liters. So we have a temperature, a pressure, an amount in moles and volume. So we can plug all of that into our equation for R. So one atmosphere times 22.4 liters divided by one mole times 273 Kelvin gives us 0 0.0821 liters times atmospheres over moles times Kelvin. So that's exactly what I just wrote on the last slide. Now, you might also remember from the very beginning of this module that um, 
real gases can deviate from ideal behavior. Um, so remember the kinetic molecular theory of gases told us that uh, gases behave in a specific way. But that's not always the case. Some gases are larger than other gases. Some gases um, do have attractions between them. And that can cause them to deviate from what we would expect of them. So real gases um, might not follow uh, what ideal gases do exactly, but the ideal gas law is still a really good approximation. Um, so this is, this is still a really useful equation. All right, so I also mentioned there are other values for the ideal gas constant. Um, so for instance, remember one atmosphere is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. So what if instead of one atmosphere, we plug in 760 millimeters of mercury? So this is the only value that changes in our equation from the last slide. And this will give us a slightly different value. So we'll get 62.4 liters times millimeters of mercury over moles times Kelvin. So again, you know, there are other values of R that you can use, um, but we're most often going to use this value, 0 0.0821. All right, so let's apply everything we just learned to a practice problem. Uh, dinitrogen oxide, N2O, which is used in dentistry, is an anesthetic, also called laughing gas. What is the pressure in atmospheres of 0.35 moles of N2O at 22 degrees Celsius in a 5 liter container? All right, so let's start with what we're given. So we're given the amount in moles. We're given the temperature in degrees Celsius. But remember, for gases, we always want to use Kelvin because it's a positive scale. So we're going to add 273 to our temperature in Celsius, and that will give us 295 Kelvin. And then uh, we're also given volume, which is five liters. And then we're trying to figure out what is the pressure. So that's our unknown variable. And then remember, we also know the gas constant, 0.0821 liters times atmospheres over moles times Kelvin. Okay, now we're going to use our ideal gas law to figure out the pressure. So we could rearrange this equation to just isolate that uh, variable. So let's divide both sides by volume. Okay, so our equation for pressure is nRT over V. Okay, so let's now plug everything we know into our equation. Okay, so N is 0 0.350 moles. R is 0 0.0821 liters times atmospheres over moles times Kelvin. Temperature, we said, was 295 Kelvin. And volume is 5 liters. All right, now let's make sure our units cancel. So moles is in the numerator here. And then in our gas constant, moles is in the denominator. So those will cancel. It's the same with Kelvin. Kelvin is in the numerator here and in the denominator of the units for the gas constant. So those will cancel. 
And then leaders in the denominator cancels with leaders in the numerator of the gas constant. So then we'll be left with atmospheres, which is good because we're trying to solve for pressure. Okay, so I'm going to plug this into my calculator. So 0.35 times 0 0.0821 times 295, all divided by 5. Okay, so my calculator gives me a really long answer. I have 1.6953, uh, etc. And my final unit is atmospheres. So let's figure out sig figs here. How many sig figs does 0 0.350 have? Three. So remember that first zero is just a placeholder zero. Um, the second zero at the end of the number is significant because it comes after a decimal point and a non-zero digit. So that last zero does count. The first zero does not count. All right, what about our gas law constant, uh, 0 0.0821? Hmm. That also has three sig figs. Those first two zeros are just placeholders, so we don't worry about those. Um, what about 295? How many sig figs does that have? Also three. That one's easy because there's um, all non-zero digits there. And then what about 5.00? How many sig figs? Three. And that's because those two zeros at the end come after a decimal and a non-zero digit. So those are also significant. Okay, so it looks like everything has three sig figs. So I'm going to limit my answer to three digits there. Okay, so it looks like the first digit we're dropping is a five, which means we have to round up. So the nine would round up to a 10 which really means that we're going from 69 to 70, if that makes sense. So we're, we're rounding up to 1.70. And I'm keeping that zero there because uh, that is significant and we want three sig figs. Okay. So it's really not too bad. Um, once you kind of identify each of your variables, um, you just plug it into the ideal gas law and you get out your final value. Um, now, sometimes you won't be given all of the correct units. Like we saw, we had to convert Celsius to Kelvin. Um, you know, in some instances, maybe you'll be given milliliters instead of liters. So you'll have to do a quick conversion there. Um, and then sometimes you might be given grams instead of moles. And you might have to convert from grams to moles before you can plug that into the ideal gas law. So then you would need molar mass as well. So, you know, just keep in mind there might be some extra steps you have to take um, before using the ideal gas law. All right. So that does bring us to gas laws and chemical reactions. So uh, we've seen a lot of different types of reactions this quarter, and we saw that sometimes gases can be reactants, sometimes they're products, sometimes they're both, um, and sometimes we need to solve for the amount of product that forms. Um, but, you know, what if we want to solve for, let's say, the pressure of a gas that forms in a reaction? We would need to use the ideal gas law. We could also use the ideal gas law to determine the moles of a gas in a reaction. Um, and we can do that if we're given the number of moles for uh, one of the other gases in a reaction or maybe one of the other reactants or products. Um, and we can also use the ideal gas law to determine the moles of any other substance using a mole to mole ratio. So this brings us back to that flow chart that we've talked about a few times now. 
So let's kind of recreate that flow chart. So let's say, uh, let's go way back to when we were just dealing with mass and moles. So we said that if we have a mass of one substance and we're trying to get to the mass of another substance, we have to convert to moles first. So we would do that using molar mass, and then we can convert to moles of another substance using ratios in a balanced chemical reaction. And then finally, we can convert to the mass of our other substance using its molar mass. Now, uh, going back to module six, we saw that we had some extra tools we can use in this flowchart. So we saw that if we're given a volume of a solution, we can use the concentration of that solution or the molarity to figure out how many moles of the solute we have. And then we can keep following our flow chart. We can then convert to moles of our other substance using ratios again. And then maybe we just solve for mass of our other substance from there. Or we could solve for the volume of our other substance, again, using the molarity of that particular substance. Now we can even add on further to this flow chart. So we could also say, well, what if we start with the pressure, the volume, and the temperature of a gas? We can use the ideal gas law to solve for moles of that gas, A, and then we could convert to moles of another substance, and then we have two options. We could go to the mass of that other substance or the volume of that other substance, depending on what it is and what we're asked to solve for. Or maybe our other substance is also a gas and we want to solve for the pressure, the volume, or the temperature of that gas. Again, we can use the ideal gas law. So now we have all of these tools that we can use. And remember, we always have to go through moles first. So those are the key components here. You can't directly uh, solve for the mass of one substance given the mass of another substance or you know you can't directly solve for the volume of one substance given the mass of another substance you have to go through moles first okay so let's apply this idea to another problem and we'll get to use the ideal gas law again so let's say we have a reaction between nitrogen gas and hydrogen gas and this produces ammonia gas nh3 Let's say we're trying to figure out how many liters of NH3, so let me change my pen color here, so how many liters of NH3, so that's volume, can be produced at 0.93 atmospheres and 24 degrees Celsius from a 16 gram sample of nitrogen gas and an excess of hydrogen gas. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack here. So let's write out what we're given. Okay, so we're given a pressure for ammonia, NH3. Uh, so that is 0 0.93 atmospheres. We're also given a temperature for ammonia. So I'm just gonna make it very clear that this is for the product. So that's uh, 24 degrees Celsius. But remember, this is a gas, so this has to be in Kelvin. So I'm going to add 273. So that gives me, oh, let's see, uh, 24 plus 273. 
297. I don't know why that was so hard for me to do in my head. <laughs> okay, and then uh, we're also given the mass of our starting reactant, which is 16, oh, my pen stopped working. There we go, 16 grams, okay. And then what we're trying to figure out is how many liters of NH3 we're forming. Okay, so let's go back to our flow chart. Um, so we're starting with N2 and we're ending with NH3. So from our problem, uh, we were given a mass of N2. So that's what we're starting with. So that means we're starting here. So then we have to convert to moles. So we're just going to follow the flow chart. And then the only direction we can go after moles of A is moles of B, and that will be NH3. So we could even replace A with N2 and then replace B with NH3. Okay, so now we have three different options. We could either convert to the mass of NH3, the volume of NH3 in terms of uh, its concentration, or we could go up to the volume of NH3 using the ideal gas law. So we can already rule out mass. That's not what we're looking for. We're looking for volume. So we can go down to the volume using molarity or up using the ideal gas law. Now we were not given a concentration because this is a gas, not a solution. So we can also rule out the bottom pathway. So what we're trying to do is go up using the ideal gas law. We're going to convert to a volume of NH3. Okay, so this is our path. We're going to start with the mass of nitrogen, convert that to moles of nitrogen using the molar mass. So we might have to do a quick calculation there. Then we're going to use the ratios in the balanced chemical equation to convert from moles of nitrogen to moles of ammonia. And then we'll plug moles of ammonia into the ideal gas law along with that pressure and temperature we were given and we'll solve for the volume. Okay. So let's do that. All right. So we're going to start with the mass of nitrogen. And again, our first step is to convert that to moles of nitrogen. So we need the molar mass. So I'm just going to do a quick molar mass calculation up above. Okay, so this is a diatomic molecule. It's one of our uh, well-known diatomic molecules. And remember, you can use the acronym Hofbrinkle to remember that. So I'm going to multiply the mass of nitrogen by 2. And on the periodic table, the mass of nitrogen is 14.007 grams per mole. So that gives me 28.014 grams per mole. Okay, so do we want to put moles in the numerator of our conversion factor or in the denominator of our conversion factor? The numerator because that's what we're trying to figure out is moles of nitrogen. And now we know that one mole of nitrogen weighs 28.014 grams. Okay, so in this first step, we canceled grams of nitrogen. So now we have moles of nitrogen. And in the next step, we're going to convert moles of nitrogen to moles, oops, ah, it froze again. There we go, <laughs> moles of NH3. So we want to cancel moles of N2. 
So let's look at our ratios in the balanced chemical equation. So how many, uh, or I guess what's the ratio between ammonia and nitrogen in our equation? So looking at the coefficients, we have a ratio of two to one. There's an invisible one there in front of nitrogen. All right, so in this step, we're canceling moles of nitrogen. So now in our last step, we're going to plug in the moles of ammonia into the ideal gas law. So this is kind of the end of our first set of calculations. So let's figure out how many moles of ammonia we have. All right, so in the numerator, we have 16 times 1 times 2. And we're going to divide that by 28.014 times 1. OK, so I get 1.14 moles of ammonia. Okay, so that's how much ammonia should theoretically be produced from this reaction. Because remember, we were told that we had an excess of hydrogen gas. So that means that nitrogen gas is our limiting reactant. So that means that 1.14 moles of ammonia is our theoretical yield. But in our last step of this problem, we actually want to figure out the volume of ammonia that's produced. Okay, so if we go back to the last slide, remember we were given pressure and temperature of ammonia, and now we figured out how many moles of ammonia we have. So we can plug this into the ideal gas law. All right, so we're trying to figure out volume here. So let's rearrange our equation to solve for volume. So we're going to divide by pressure on both sides. So volume is equal to nRT over P. Okay. All right, so now we can plug in the moles of NH3 and uh, we'll multiply that by the gas constant. And uh, again, I'll give this value to you on quizzes and exams because I don't expect you to have it memorized just yet. Um, when you get to general chemistry, you'll probably have this number memorized because you'll be using it so often. All right, and then temperature we said was, let me go back. 297, that's right. And then we're dividing by the pressure, which is 0 0.93 atmospheres. Okay, so let's make sure all of our units cancel appropriately. So moles will cancel, Kelvin will cancel, and atmospheres will cancel. So our final unit will be liters, which is what we want for volume. Okay, so I'm just going to plug all of this into my calculator. So 1.14 times 0 0.0821 times 297 divided by 0.93. All right, so I get 29.9 liters of NH3. Okay, great. So again, uh, these flow charts that we went over are super handy um, because, you know, once you kind of figure out what you're given and what you need, you can just apply that to this chart. So on the left, you can figure out what am I given? Am I given the volume and a concentration? Am I given the mass? Or am I given pressure, volume, and temperature? And then you can figure out what you need. Do I need 
to figure out the volume in terms of a gas? Do I need to figure out the mass or do I need to figure out the volume uh, given a concentration? Um, so definitely utilize this flow chart or if you have a different chart that you want to create and remember, that's okay too. This isn't the only way to remember how to do these problems. It's just one way. All right, so in our last and final video next time, we'll talk about partial pressure, and this will be a pretty quick video. Um, also, I do have a worksheet on Canvas dealing with gases and gas laws. Um, so if you want to practice these problems more, definitely go through that worksheet. And I'll also post the key so that you can double check your work. Also, if you have any questions for me, always feel free to email me or message me on Canvas um, or reach out to the Writing and Tutoring Center. They're super helpful. Okay, so I will see you in our last and final